Hi, my name is Dr. Scott Resnick. I'm a practicing endodontist in Manhattan, New York. Today, we are going to describe the various steps of endodontics from start to finish. Endodontics is an intricate procedure for sure, but can be very rewarding for both clinicians as well as, of course, our patients. Let's take a minute to state the main goal of endodontics. It is the prevention and or elimination of bacterial infection and inflammation associated with the canal system. From the beginning of modern endodontics, we have relied on the radiograph as a critical part of our diagnosis, prognosis, and of course treatment. Today we have an additional tool that has quickly become the standard, and that is cone beam computed tomography, or CBCT. Regarding the importance of this technology, the American Association of Endodontics and the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology issued a joint position statement on when CBCT should be employed. This paper starts out by telling us when CBCT should not be used. It said CBCT should only be used if the patient's history and clinical examination demonstrate that the benefit to the patient outweighs the potential risks. CBCT should not be used for endodontic diagnosis or for screening purposes in the absence of clinical signs and symptoms. The clinician should only use CBCT when the need for imaging cannot be met by lower dose two-dimensional radiography. Lowe, Dula, and Bergen et al. compared periapical radiography and limited cone beam computed tomography in posterior maxillary teeth referred for apical surgery. They found that 34% of the lesions were missed by periapical radiography and virtually no lesions were missed with cone beam computed tomography. So how does this bear out in the real world? Well, this patient presented shortly after a traumatic injury to the maxillary anterior teeth. You can clearly see a slightly widened PDL on tooth number eight and radiolucent lines indicating possible fracture. It does not tell us the extent of the likely fracture and does not tell us if it is buccal or lingual. It does not tell us a lot of things because it is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. But when we take a cone beam, we can clearly see the extent of the fracture line. We see how far below the crest of the bone it extends and whether or not to even attempt treatment, saving the patient time, pain, and of course, money. Today's patients have higher expectations and are more knowledgeable. And as clinicians, the more we know, the more responsibility we have to give them the treatments they deserve. This is another case that illustrates the efficacy of cone beam when dealing with complicated situations. What we have here is an endodontic failure and it looks like a pretty straightforward failure, perhaps even one that I would make a small access through the existing crown and then place a post or replace the crown. It looks like there is a diffuse radiolucency at the apex, a slightly widened PDL, and a tooth that perhaps we should consider for retreatment. And if not retreatment, then possibly an apicoectomy. That is, of course, until we took a cone beam and saw this fracture line in the tooth. There is no way you could have ever predicted a fracture like this using conventional radiography. Another really great example of the importance of cone beam is in the diagnosis and treatment of resorption cases. This is the resorption guide from Jeffrey Hithersay, and it shows the three classes of ECIR, or extra canal invasive resorption. Class one is treatable, class two may be treatable, class three is probably not treatable, and class four is clearly not treatable. A two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object does not really show us much, and the previous dentist reflected the tissue, made a small access prep, filled it with amalgam, and then put the tissue back in place. One year later, the general dentist took this radiograph, showing evidence that the lesion had grown. He then referred the patient to us, and we, of course, immediately took a cone beam, which not only showed the extent of the lesion, but that it had spread to the lingual aspect of the tooth. This helped us illustrate to the dentist and to the patient who was adamant about trying to save the tooth why this lesion was much too extensive to consider treating. This is a patient who presented to us after access was made by a general dentist. The general dentist at this point felt uncomfortable about finding all of the anatomy and wanted to stop before there was a perforation. He knew they were close and so he sent the patient to our office. We of course took this radiograph and were a bit alarmed by how deep the access was relative to the furcation, so we took a cone beam. On the cone beam, we can see the extent of the axis. We can see actually how close it comes at its deepest point to the furcation in all dimensions. We were able to determine that although the axis looks pretty deep, 
we are still in intact tooth and in fact it's a tooth we should be able to save. We can look at this in increments, working our way up the canal to see exactly how patent the canals are, where they are, how much further we have to drill to get to them, and all of this will greatly enhance our ability to get the result we want. This case illustrates the importance of cone beam in endodontics as much as any other case we could show you. This is a root canal done by a general dentist who subsequently placed a post and a long span bridge. Six months later, there is now radiographic evidence of pathology, the patient is uncomfortable, and the dentist sent him to our associate, Dr. Courtney Lindenberg, for an apicoectomy. As part of her exam, she took a comb beam. What she found was that there was actually a second root that had never been treated, and you can see it here. You can also see the radiolucency at the apex. So rather than remove this tooth or perform an apicoectomy, she elected to make a small access through the porcelain bridge and treat just the missed canal. Her patient saw immediate results, and as this six-month radiograph shows, there is evidence that the lesion is shrinking. I hope that illustrates the importance of comb beam computing tomography. Now, not everyone is going to go out and buy one of these machines, but it is likely that your local endodontist either has one or knows where to send their patients. In our time, it is hard to fathom a discussion on endodontics without magnification on the order of a microscope. No study illustrated this more to me than the Burley Barrow study of 2002. It showed how difficult it was to find the mesiobuccal number two canal of the maxillary first or second molar without magnification. The canal, which we all know is found somewhere around, let's say, 85% of the time, depending on the literature, well, without magnification, they found it 17.2% of the time. If you added magnification, you were up at 62.5% of the time. An incredible jump. If you then look at how often you would find that fourth canal if you were using a microscope, you would be around 71% of the time. One more illustration, this is the back of a $5 bill showing the Lincoln Memorial, and that is at 2.5 times magnification, which is pretty typical for loops. This is at approximately 15 times magnification using my microscope. I would say that this is a pretty significant difference in magnification and something we should all consider when delving into endodontics. To illustrate even further the importance of technology, I would like to show you a few research papers that really bring home the extent of what we are dealing with and why it is so important to embrace new technologies. In a research paper by Carpenter and Associates, they found a mid-mesial canal in the mandibular first and second molar 18 to 22 percent of the time and Fan, in his 3D modeling article, found that 85% of mandibular first and second molars have an isthmus in the apical 5 millimeters. Clearly, there is a potential for a large percent of endodontic procedures to fail due to complicated anatomy present most of the time. Let's just look at this model that illustrates a type of anatomy we so often see in these mandibular molars. You can see what is coming into play now. That is the distal root showing two canals with rather complicated anatomy and multiple portals of exit. Now look at this part of the model. That three canal aspect, that's the mesial root, and some variation of this anatomy is present often and of course needs to be addressed. So how are we going to deal with all of this? Well, first we need to keep in mind that the first few steps of our procedure will set the tone for the rest of our case. There are things in endodontics that are absolutes and other things that come down to personal preference. I'll explain these areas as we go through the rest of this presentation. To begin, it is critically important to achieve straight line access while still maintaining a conservatively sized chamber. There are many ways to go about this. However, piezo ultrasonic technology is my preference. It provides me a safe way to find hidden canals by troughing the chamber floor, all while maintaining excellent visibility in our working space. Additionally, ultrasonics can be used to help remove pulp stones, obturation materials, and separated instruments. One absolute is establishing working length using an apex locator. As I'll discuss later when I cover apical constrictions, we have to remember it's necessary to only measure to the constriction. Apex locators are not all created equal as some devices react differently in different canal environments with regard to moisture. It's important to find one that works well for you. I use the Promark apex locator because of its consistently accurate reading and great graphics. Once we've accessed our canals and working length is accurately achieved, the next crucial step is to establish a smooth and reproducible glide path. The clinician who owns the glide path owns the case. 
This can be accomplished through standard stainless steel files. However, with the improvements in file technology, there are now safer and more efficient ways to go about this. Pro gliders were designed to create an expanded glide path once your working length is established up to a 10 file. Pro gliders use NITI M wire technology, which makes it even more flexible than traditional NITI. They are uniquely designed with a 16 diameter tip that progressively tapers. You can feel comfortable knowing that any rotary files that follow the ProGlider will just work more efficiently and safely in your canal space. So now that we own the glide path, let's discuss the instruments that we are going to use today. My preference is the Wave 1 Gold. The most important aspect of treatment is that the practitioner is comfortable with the instruments they are using. Dan Splice Serona makes different instruments for different practitioners. The three most popular engine driven files they make are the Wave 1 Gold, the Pro Taper Series, and Vortex Blue. And now, the Wave 1 Gold system includes its own glide path file, the Wave 1 Gold Glider, which is perfect for staying within the reciprocating motion of the Wave 1 Gold files. All are excellent instruments with next generation titanium technology, but I am going to tell you why I prefer the Wave 1 Gold. What is unique about the Wave 1 Gold? Well, at any given time, it never has more than two points of contact. That is really important because it is less likely to engage and fracture the file if not hitting in that many places at one time. You can see from this SEM exactly that rectangular cross-section. The end of the file is only slightly cutting and this non-aggressive blunt tip is not likely to dig its way into a fin or perhaps create a ledge. It has a unique double helix spiral in the last few millimeters that helps the file channel material back away from the apical aspect of the canal. Also, it is a reciprocating file as opposed to a rotary file. Most files on the market today are rotary. They spin in one direction. A reciprocating file moves back and forth and back and forth, never fully digging its way in but cutting and then backing away, cutting and backing away. This file was designed with the knowledge that the apical constriction is generally small. We use the file in a crown down fashion. We spend very little time at the apex with this file. Bacteria do not penetrate deep into the dentin in the apical third, so we don't need to really widen the apical third very much. Of course, another very important principle we will go over is the metallurgy involved in this next generation of titanium. Let me show you what the motion looks like. It cuts and then backs out. It cuts on the counterclockwise motion and then it backs out, cuts and backs out. This asymmetrical reciprocation allows the file to disengage moving debris coronally and cutting in an extremely efficient way. Let's go over design rationale in more depth. In this article by Yuri Cutler in 1955, one of the great classic articles that all anodontic students have to read, he illustrated that there is a minor and major foramen. And it's the minor foramen that is the true end of the canal. Again, this is why it's so crucial to use your Promark apex locator to determine working length. He also illustrated that over time, the relationship between the minor foramen and the major foramen changes. We deposit cementum our entire life and so the apex, relative to a radiograph, is different for an 80 year old than it is for an 18 year old. And our instrumentation should be adjusted to reflect that. Another aspect of design rationale in producing the Wave 1 Gold instrument is the fact that the anatomy at the apex of most canals is very small. From 0.2 millimeters to 0.26 millimeters or 200 microns to 260 microns. So the primary file in the Wave 1 system was designed at 0.25 millimeters at the apex. Additionally, we can look at Love's research on dentin penetration of bacteria and see that the most they penetrate is 60 microns. This allows you to address most canal anatomy sufficiently with just that one file. You can also see from this micro CT that the canals are very small and there are multiple portals of exit. Another aspect of the design rationale was taper. They wanted a variable taper so as to not take too much coronal dentin away. Variable taper has the added benefit of reduced resistance to the file getting to the apex in a timely and efficient manner. This next generation titanium starts out as regular titanium and then it is ground and heat treated. Heat treatment turns it gold but more importantly creates the properties that make this such significant advance in titanium technology. How significant? Let me show you in a couple of illustrations. If you bend a Wave 1 file to a 45 degree angle in this jig, 
you can reciprocate it for five minutes and 56 seconds before it would fail on average. That is a 17.5% improvement over previous titanium. It takes 1.625 newtons on average to allow it to turn a 45 degree curve in a three millimeter radius. That is a 48% improvement on flexibility. If you put the file in a jig that clamps the last three millimeters and start rotating the file, you can rotate it 437.35 degrees on average before seeing failure, and that is a 53% improvement over previous titanium technology. Another way to look at how important this new titanium is, is force of flexion. It takes 58.65 Newton average to bend it 90 degrees, and that is an 87% improvement. That is with the last three millimeters clamped. But my favorite aspect of this new technology is its ability to retain shape. One of the most important aspects of a titanium file is of course flexibility, but it is also one of the least desirable characteristics. If you think about a file that will easily flex down any canal, it is also a file that wants to constantly straighten itself. You cannot pre-bend it like you would pre-bend a stainless steel file. If you think about the action of that file in a canal, it is more likely to instrument one aspect of the canal more so than the other. If the file could retain its shape, that is less likely to occur. You are more likely to have a more evenly instrumented canal to address more of the anatomy. As a side benefit, we have all experienced trying to get a rotary file or any file into a mesial buckle or mesial canal of a mandibular molar or a mesial buckle canal of a maxillary molar where the patient has a limited opening and or your conservative crown access does not allow you to easily get your file into position. With a titanium instrument, which is actually straight until it goes into the canal, it becomes really difficult. You can pre-bend the Densplice Serona Gold Files. You can easily get this file into virtually any canal orifice. Before this technology was available, that was extremely difficult. I found the source of all that gold titanium. This is in Thailand, and this is the Karen people. They add these rings to their neck, and over time, they stretch their neck to such an incredible extent. This flexibility, this ability to maintain the integrity of a curve to cut in a canal more evenly, allows us to stay equally distant in a curve on both sides, not transporting the apex in a complicated curve. It allows us to address the anatomy, even in this third molar, that before would have been that much more difficult. Complex anatomy can so much more easily be addressed with this next generation of titanium using a crown down technique. Notice in this S-curve how well we maintain the shape of the canal, staying equidistant even in this really complicated dilacerated mesial buccal root with two canals, we were able to stay even throughout the canal. It allows us to make a very small access using a pre-bent file and get the result we want. So what do these files look like? They come in four sizes. They come in a small size, yellow, which is at a 0.2 diameter approximately at the apex. Of course, all of these files have a variable taper. And this one starts out at 0.07 and at D16, it is approximately 0.045. The primary file, the file you would use in the majority of cases, is 0.25 at the apex and 0.955 near D16. The taper starts at 0.07 at the apex and decreases to 0.06. The medium file, used when the red file finds its way too quickly to the apex, is a 0.35 with a 0.06 taper, decreasing to a 0.05 taper at D16. The large file you would use in mostly distal and palatal canals. Its taper decreases from 0.05 to 0.04 and its diameter is 0.45 at the apex. Let's go over the process of how we work with these files. The key to this crown down procedure is reciprocation. Once we have established the glide path and our measurement, we then go on to our reciprocating instruments, but not until then. The basic premise is you find your measurement, you establish patency, Irrigate, establish patency again, irrigate, go in with your glide path file, and we will illustrate this more in detail shortly. Irrigate again, and check again with your non-cutting instrument. You want to use a file that will non-end cut because there is no reason to. If the canal is patent in the coronal and middle thirds, it is patent at the apex. It might be very curved and complicated, but it is patent. When people get blocked out, they get blocked out because oftentimes they use an aggressive file when none is necessary. You want a file that will easily find its way along the path that already exists. 
There is no reason to cut a path. If you have to cut a path to the apex, then how did the blood supply and innervation exist in that canal? That is not to say that there are not calcified canals and aberrant calcifications in areas, but for the most part, and in the vast majority of situations, it is completely inappropriate to use an end cutting file. After we have irrigated again and established our glide path, we then go in with our crown down reciprocating wave one gold file. How do we determine which file to use? Well, we start with the red file. The bottom line is the coronal and middle third of the canal are going to be the first aspects of the canal we want to aggressively instrument anyway. We enter the canal with our red file. If we find that the canal is much too wide and we are immediately approaching the apex, a file should go clearly past the middle third, but not immediately to the apex. If you find that the red, yellow, or even green file drops too fast to the apex, then you move up to the next size file. Conversely, if you start with the red file and feel that the file is going nowhere near the middle third, drop back to the yellow file. With each change of the file, we recapitulate with our 10 file. We irrigate again, and then we start with the reciprocating instrument. This copious irrigation is going to maintain the patency of the canal for us and make all instrumentation work that much more effectively. Let's look at this video. So you can see, first we place the file in the canal and establish not only the working length, but that we have a clear straight path, and that the coronal aspect of our canal is sufficiently opened so that the file does not have to negotiate the first part of the canal. We irrigate again and re-enter with our recapitulation 10 file. This again will create a consistently tapered narrow path that allows us to keep these canals patent for the entire procedure. We again irrigate. We recapitulate and irrigate again. We then go in with our wave one gold. We find our way in and we use approximately five brush stroke passes. We cut on the way out. This is an important point. We never push harder than the pressure we would use on a number two pencil with any of the files. If you think the pencil tip is going to break from the pressure you are using, then you are using too much pressure. There is no need for pressure. This file will cut efficiently and effectively without pushing. If you are pushing and feeling like you are not getting anywhere, then change the file. Go down to the yellow file. Recapitulate again. Check your glide path. Make sure it is clear. Make sure the canal is patent. Irrigate. When you are performing this technique in the correct manner and correct fashion, you are going to see that it is very effective, very efficient, and quickly cutting and shaping that canal for you. Five passes times three, irrigate, recapitulate, irrigate, and then five passes again times three. For the vast majority of canals, you should be at or very close to your apex. So the Wave 1 Gold is an incredible file. If you look at this study from 2001 by Peters in the International Journal of Endodontics, certainly before the Wave 1 Gold came into existence, it showed that all instrumentation techniques left 35% or more of the canal service area unchanged. Let's say that modern metallurgy and technique have dropped this down to 30%. That still leaves a lot of canal uninstrumented. How are we going to address that? Well, the answer is we are going to address it chemically because no matter how good the instrument gets, as we know from micro CT and CBCT scans, there is no possible way we are going to mechanically instrument all aspects of the canal. So as we stated at the beginning, if the goal of endodontics is the prevention and or elimination of bacterial infection and inflammation associated with the canal system, we need to remove the source of this and since we know we cannot get everywhere mechanically, we have to have chemical solutions that will address these needs. As you know, bacteria form biofilm structures to protect themselves and of course we create a smear layer with our instrumentation. We need to dissolve the smear layer and the biofilm. The goal of our irrigation is to debride the canal, dissolve any tissue, remove any smear layer we create, and kill microbes. We want a clean environment. We want to be able to clean the canals as best we can, as efficaciously and non-caustically a way as we can. So what are the solutions traditionally available to us? Well, we know that sodium apochlorite dissolves organic tissue. We know it kills microbes. It has no effect on inorganic tissue. It weakens in contact with other materials. It can be caustic or toxic to the periapical tissue. You have to be careful about extension beyond the apex. Of course, it can have a harmful effect on dentin structure if left there too long. Then we have EDTA. EDTA is a chelating agent. We know it removes smear layer effectively. It will not really kill bacteria. 
it does not dissolve tissue, and it may erode dentin with long-time exposure. Chlorhexidine kills bacteria. It improves long-term dentin bonding to resins. It does not dissolve tissue. It does not disrupt biofilm, but it does kill bacteria well. A survey in 2010 showed that most endodontists use some combination of bleach and EDTA or bleach plus EDTA plus chlorhexidine or just bleach only. But one that you never want to use is bleach plus EDTA and then bleach again. Bleach should never be the final rinse inside a canal. It is much too caustic to the dentin. Once the EDTA worked its magic, remove the smear layer, the last thing you want to do is put bleach on the exposed dentin. It will erode the dentin. In smear layer removal studies, 5.25% of sodium apochloride using distilled water in the final rinse showed it did not really do anything to dissolve the smear layer. But EDTA, on the other hand, clearly shows in the coronal, middle, and even apical thirds a considerable amount of smear layer removal. We know that sodium apochlorite is great at removing tissue. We know that EDTA is great at dissolving the smear layer. So we kind of need both. It is not a one or the other thing. But using sodium apochlorite to kill bacteria after EDTA has removed the biofilm, will cause dented erosion. This slide shows what sodium apochlorite and then a second step with EDTA does to the dentin. You can see nice access to the tubules, but if you follow the EDTA with sodium apochlorite again, you get this kind of erosion. The sodium apochlorite is the wrong answer to killing bacteria once we have removed the biofilm. We need an irrigant after sodium apochlorite that will remove the plaque and kill the bacteria. This quote from Jim Gutman sums it up. An ideal second irrigant may be one that combines the functions of smear layer removal with secondary bacteria killing in a single synergistic step. And that is where Cumix comes into play. We use it after sodium apochlorite has removed the tissue. It is great at removing the smear layer. It is great at, as a disinfecting final rinse. It is incredibly easy to use and has a detergent to make sure that it really penetrates well by reducing surface tension. Research by Gillespie showed it was superior to 17% EDTA in removing the smear layer in instrumented teeth. It even demonstrated superior cleaning of the tubules in all three levels, the coronal, the middle, and the apical third. In direct comparison to 17% EDTA, Cumix, that was even two years old, was significantly better at removing debris and biofilm and clearing out access to the tubules. Franklin Tay at the Medical College of Georgia stated that Cumix also completely removes the smear layer and smear plugs, is slightly less aggressive than EDTA, and there is less demineralization of the intact dentin collagen. This slide shows the results of a 90-second final rinse of 17% EDTA versus a 90-second final rinse of Cumix. Cumix clearly leaves the area much more intact. At this magnification, you can see the collagen fibril shrinkage. There is clearly less damage to the dentin with Cumix, which subsequently would help prevent bacterial seepage. Its antibacterial efficacy is incredible. Five seconds of exposure to E. faecalis, one of the nastiest bugs we encounter, will result in a 99.9983% destruction of that colony. Even in the aged Cumix, it is virtually the same result. As I showed, it is more efficacious than using EDTA and chlorhexidine but as significantly, when you irrigate with chlorhexidine to kill bacteria at the end, it will combine with residual sodium apochlorite left in the canal and you will get a precipitate. When you mix the Cumix and sodium apochlorite, there is no precipitate. There is also no precipitate between EDTA and sodium apochlorite, but once you use the EDTA, expose the dentin, and you want to kill the bacteria that resides under that biofilm, you cannot go back to the sodium apochlorite without creating a lot of destruction to the dentin. So what do you do? If you go to the chlorhexidine, you are going to get a precipitate. In fact, on the far right, look at the precipitate you get from chlorhexidine and EDTA. It is really significant and it blocks tubules. It does more harm than it does good. Even after 24 hours, chlorhexidine and sodium apochlorite can cause precipitate. The Cumix never creates a precipitate. So what is our protocol for irrigation? Well, after initial access, we irrigate with sodium apochlorite, dry the chamber, and obtain a measurement. We then instrument the canal and irrigate with sodium apochlorite. We use the endo activator, and I will show you that in a little bit as we go through a case. We irrigate with Cumix, complete the instrumentation, and use the endo activator with the Cumix. We verify the measurements. We then dry the canal and obturate. 
So once again, the benefits of Cumix are superior smear layer removal compared to the 17% EDTA, incredible ability to disinfect with 99.99% of the efficalis killed within five seconds of exposure, and very easy chair side handling. I mentioned the endoactivator. Let's look at the endoactivator and see its effect. We talked about how important these irrigants are, and we talked about instrumentation. But if I place an irrigant in a canal and it remains in there in somewhat of a stagnant fashion, it is not really going to extend as I would like it into that additional anatomy that we have seen so clearly on the micro CT scans. How do I get my irrigant to extend to those places? The endoactivator is a sonic vibrating tool with a nylon tip. I explain it to my patients in this way. I tell them that this vibrating tool looks like an electric toothbrush with one long bristle. That bristle goes down the canal and agitates the irrigant. Let me show you what that looks like. Clearly, it shows debris in the chamber that was not there before. As we have discussed, the anatomy is very complicated. This is the mesial buccal and mesial lingual canals with an isthmus in between. We are going to address this isthmus with ultrasonics, but what is below that isthmus? What is apical to that isthmus? Is potentially all kinds of complicated anatomy. In fact, sometimes, as we saw previously, a mandibular molar can have a mid-mesial canal in that space. Let's look again at the effect of the endoactivator in this plastic model. Once we troughed that isthmus, we found another canal and then instrumented and ultimately obturated all three canals. You can see three canals and oftentimes when there is a mid-mesial canal it will combine with an adjacent canal, but not always. Okay, so we know there is complicated anatomy, we know we need really good instrumentation, we know we have to activate our irrigants to get into all of those nooks and crannies, and now I'm going to move on to how we fill these canals. Herb Schilder in 1967 laid out for us exactly what we need to achieve in endodontics. He said, in the final analysis, it is a sealing off of the complex root canal system from the periodontal ligament and bone, which ensures the health of the attachment apparatus against breakdown of endodontic origin. What is required is a deeper appreciation of the importance of filling canals laterally and in depth as well as vertically, and then the adaptation of clinical technique to make the objective both simple and effective. So we showed you an article by Yuri Cutler written in 1955. This is an article by his son, Sergio Cutler, where he took 12 random extracted mandibular molars, cut off the distal root, and then randomly selected two of the 12. Took radiographs, and from the radiographs, you can see they look pretty similar. He then did a micro CT scan of each. Look how dramatically different the anatomy is. You can never tell that from the radiograph, but that is what we are facing so often. We cannot possibly know from our instrumentation exactly what we are dealing with, so we need to extend our ability to clean these canals, as I said, with irrigants and activation of those irrigants. Micro CT scans are dramatic in that they show us all of the additional portals of exit and how complicated the anatomy is. This gives us a better understanding of why it is so important that we not only instrument teeth well, but irrigate well and use proper irrigants that will remove the tissue and the biofilm from the canal walls, which in turn allows us to access the lateral canals in complicated anatomy. If we are not removing the smear layer and the biofilm, we are never going to get our irrigants to extend into those places. Again, it illustrates why this is so important for us. Let's talk about the way we fill these canals. If we are going to access all of this complicated anatomy, it is not possible for one, two, or three pieces of cold gutta percha to fully obturate the complicated anatomy we know exists. Vertical compaction or condensation is a wonderful technique but it is not, in our opinion, the most efficacious way of moving thermoplastic gutta percha into a complicated anatomy. Gutta core is proving itself to be the standard of how to move material into complicated anatomy. Gutta core is a carrier-based thermoplastic gutta percha made by Densply Serona. There are two types of gutta percha in gutta core. The outer layer is heat-sensitive gutta percha that will flow readily and adapt to the internal anatomy and the inner layer has been modified through cross-linking to maintain stiffness and act as a carrier, bringing the softened outer layer into the complicated anatomy. If you need to remove it, it removes with ease, just like regular gutta percha. The technique is very simple. Once I finish my instrumentation, I insert the appropriate size verifier file. It is a simple verification system. Yellow is a 20, red is a 25, blue is a 30, and so on. I know that if my size verifier drops snugly but easily to my measurement, so will the corresponding gutta core. 
Once we have our size verification, we coat the coronal third lightly with cement and then insert the gutta core. Once it is setting, you remove the handle easily by bending it or using a spoon excavator. You can remove the gutta core just like you would any other gutta percha for post prep or retreatment. It comes with a very specific oven to heat the gutta percha to a very specific temperature. The system is easy as can be. You turn it on, lower the gutta core into the oven, and when it beeps, you remove it. It fills the canal so perfectly that all you need is a very tiny drop of cement. In fact, it's analogous to the tiny amount of cement you would need to seat a well-made crown. In fact, the gutta core flows so readily that when I place the obturator in one canal, I will put a paper point in any adjacent canal because I know that the gutta core will flow into any communication between them. Let's go through the entire process with this block. We start out with our irrigation as always. We place a file to the apex. We make sure we have a patent canal, patent to and beyond the apex. We irrigate again, always using copious irrigation. We enter the canal with a file that easily finds the apex. Take our measurements and record our results using an apex locator. Again, irrigation, and begin using our file we will use to reciprocate to make sure that we have easy access to the entire canal. We irrigate, and you can see the debris starting to build in that apical and middle third. We go back in, and this is why we constantly recapitulate with our non-end cutting file, like I discussed earlier. Once we have that, we can start with our primary wave one file. Because we see that the primary file is going beyond the middle third to just into the apical third, we know it's the only wave one file we will likely need. If I thought the primary file dropped much too close to the apex right away, I would move up to the green or 35. If I felt I was getting nowhere near the apex and I was kind of stuck in the coronal third, I would start out with the yellow, the 20. Again, I irrigate, recapitulate, irrigate again, and go back in. Approximately five brush strokes. Again, no more pressure than I would use with a number two pencil. You can see the kind of debris it is generating, how incredibly well this instrument cleans the canal. Again, because it has some memory, it is cleaning the canal evenly. It is not just cleaning one side of the canal. It does not have the typical desire of conventional titanium to straighten, to only want to clean one aspect. We re-entered again with the file we were, are working with, and we can see the debris still coming out. We irrigate again, getting closer to the apex and clearly removing as much of the debris from the canal as we can. Always copious irrigation. We recapitulate again, make sure we are patent, and then go in with our endo activator. As I stated before, the endo activator creates 30 to 40,000 shock waves with each bubble implosion. It creates an incredible amount of energy to get that irrigant moving into all of those accessory canals and complex anatomy. We go in with our size verifier, dry the canal, and place in a very small amount of cement. Slightly coat the walls and spread it out evenly. We then place the gutta core that has been heated and place it in a slow, direct motion to the apex. Stop at our measurement, maintain gentle, gentle pressure at that measurement, and then break off the excess. We can later pack that or create a post space, whatever is necessary. Let's look at how nicely it flows into place. We can use a small spoon, quickly remove the excess. In this situation, I would have placed a paper point in the mesiolingual canal because of any communication. But again, see what we have done here? It is very tight space and difficult to access. We can remove the tip and use a college pliers to move the gutta core into place and again use a spoon to clean off the excess. We then use a shoulder plugger to vertically pack that last coronal bit and clean off the excess. Again, you can bend the obturator, you can use a spoon excavator or a burr in very tight cases where you have very small access and it's not easy to bend it at the canal orifice. I want to show you one more time how significant this is. When this obturator goes to the length, watch what happens with any excess air in the canal. You see a little bubble form along the side of the material and pop. Look how much excess gutta percha there is. There is much more gutta percha on any obturator than would ever theoretically be needed for a particular canal. We then use our spoon excavator and then clean the chamber. I mentioned Fan's article on the complex apical anatomy in the mesial root of mandibular first and second molars. This is an illustration from that article showing how complex the anatomy is. You cannot possibly think that a single cone or lateral technique would ever possibly address this anatomy. The gutta core has a much better chance. Let us show you how easy it is to make a post space. It is no different than conventional gutta percha. It comes out. 
It disintegrates just like conventional gutta percha and it will get into anatomy you never thought existed. This tooth has three mesial canals but it is even more complicated at the apex as you can see with material going in different directions. In our office as endodontists we often see patients who present for endodontic retreatment or surgery. A very common failure we see is in the mesial roots of mandibular first molars. Because the bone in the mandible is the densest bone in your body, the path of least resistance oftentimes is to drain through the sulcus. You will commonly find a pocket along the buccal aspect of the mesial root. This presentation is typically diagnosed as a vertical fracture, but it is not. It is just the path of least resistance. They take a radiograph five or six years after endodontics had been performed and everything had looked fine. All of a sudden, there is pathology. They see this pocket and radiographic evidence of pathology in the bone and just determine that it must be cracked. Why else would this form? Well, the why else is clear. It is illustrated in the micro CTs that I showed you that show how complicated the anatomy is and how often you could have a mid-mesial canal. Rather than extract these teeth, we will go in and retreat the mesial root. This radiograph illustrates the best way to angle the film you take when treating a mandibular molar. By taking the film from the distal, you can move the mesial buckle away from the mesial lingual sufficiently to see how much space there is between the canals. That is a decent indicator that there might just be more anatomy in between those two canals. Sure enough, we gained access and you could see a black line between the mesial buckle and the mesial lingual. That black line is black because there is tissue in there. That tissue needed to be removed from the beginning. That isthmus needed to be troughed and it wasn't. So we troughed the isthmus and lo and behold, we find another canal. We instrument and filled and one year later the patient presented with a new coronal restoration and radiographic and clinical evidence of healing. The gutta core allows you to fill canals in directions you could never have otherwise filled. This is my size verifier film confirming my measurement and then I fill. You can see how nice the gutta core flows in places you could never get it to with single point or lateral techniques. I would submit to you that gutta core has the best chance of getting into complex anatomy. This is a tooth that was so long we could not get the buccal and the palatal apices on one film. We had to take two. Look how complicated. Look at all the lateral canals we have addressed in the apical third of the palatal root. Yes, I know that is pretty neat first molar anatomy, but let's look at the second molar. This patient presented to our office after access by a general dentist who did not feel he sufficiently addressed all of the canals. He thought he was missing anatomy and clearly he was, because under the microscope I found it was not one buccal canal as he thought but two. We instrumented and filled and look at that lateral canal on the palatal root near the apex. So gutta core is an incredible material. In conclusion, we certainly can recognize the complexities that root canal treatment has to offer. However, with the advancements in today's technology, we can appreciate our newfound ability to treat such complex situations with greater ease and confidence. As I mentioned earlier, it is my belief that there are certain steps in a root canal procedure that are absolutes such as using an apex locator, establishing a smooth glide path, following a proper irrigation protocol, which includes proper instrumentation, and sealing the canal space three-dimensionally. I want to thank all of you for spending your time with me today, and I wish you and your patients all the best.